it's funny being back in an academic institution because I started my career in academia and I call myself a recovering academic. I think it's the most appropriate <laughs> term. Um, but it, it's interesting because I think that this is an area where the academic world that many of you are involved in and, uh, pardon me for calling it this, the real world in which many of the business people, uh, police forces, public servants, etc. are involved in really do collide. And the work that's being done on the future of modern languages is so critical to outcomes socially, as Nick was talking about a moment ago, and of course economically as well. Um, let me start out by introducing myself, and then I'll get into a couple of the themes about why I think language learning remains so important to the economy. I told you I'm a recovering academic. Uh, as you can hear from my accent, I'm a bit of a Mongol as well. Uh, actually, it's quite right. I was born in Washington and raised in Washington, where I did have the privilege of starting uh, to learn French as a primary school student. So Vona's point about starting early is, of course, a very important one indeed. I then made my life more complicated by moving to this country for my education. I had to learn an entirely new language, English, <laughs> to add to American. Um, then I married a Spaniard and had to learn Spanish because I had mono, monolingual uh, in-laws uh, who then speak Valencian with their wider family. <laughs> so my life has gotten more and more complicated over the years and hopefully I've picked up enough of each of those languages to communicate. If my English does fail me over the next few minutes, please do say. Um, the British Chambers of Commerce then, um, as Astrid noted, we represent businesses of all sizes uh, around the country. My job effectively is to represent and reflect the interests of those companies, some of whom will be sole traders operating out of back bedrooms, some of whom will be major multinational companies with uh, offices around the world, um, to the UK government, and to a limited extent also via the uh, European Chamber Network uh, at uh, Brussels and uh, the European institutions. Um, this issue does come up as a business priority on a regular basis. And funnily enough, it's not just uh, in those big multinational corporations who are involved across the world and who have implantations across the world, but also smaller companies as well. A uh, recent president of the British Chambers of Commerce, uh, Isabella Moore, owner of a translation business and a, a top language advocate who spent most of her time as president of our organization fighting for better recognition of the importance of language um, and its future in the UK context. Um, we're fighting for a year for growth across the UK, and this agenda really does uh, link directly into that. Um, our major priorities right now, recruitment, planning and premises, business investment and support for exporters. When you think about both recruitment and support for exporters, you won't get far before you come up against the question of language and the question of whether SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, have the skills that they need to internationalise. And, and it's something where we've seen quite a few deficiencies, unfortunately. We have to turn the mirror back on our own members and say to them, hang on a second, actually, language is one of the areas where you have a barrier to your business's future growth. Um, I think there are three areas overall where uh, this really matters, this whole agenda really matters to the economy. The first is employers' stated inability to find the workers that they need with the appropriate skills for the job. Um, that is a generic way of, of, of putting the, the UK's skills gaps and skills problems, but I think language is a critical ingredient there. The second, as I sort of alluded to a moment ago, is a link between language skills and uh, UK SMEs' export potential, their potential to internationalise. We all know that the sources of growth over the next few years are not going to be from domestic demand, and actually they're not going to be from European economies either, which are slow growing. They're going to be from some of the countries that Werner was just referring to in his talk, where, in fact, we have very limited penetration and where our smaller companies literally lack the skills to get engaged in the first place and begin the very first thing that they need to do before getting the business, which, of course, is networking. Networking requires communication and language. Third big area, um, I think, is the impact of our poor language skills as a nation on our ability to shape the European and the global business environment. So let me take those three in turn. Starting with uh, employer demand for skills. Um, can, I, can I just ask, uh, for those of you in the audience, how many of you here are from the academic sector today? Can you just raise your hands for me? Nearly everyone. Anyone here a, a, a private sector employer at all? One in the back? Two? Right, just, just a couple. Uh, and, uh, and of our two private sector employers, are you confident that you can get the language skills you need here in this country? Yes? No? Sitting on the fence, classic audience response. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, usually that means no. 
Um, businesses across the country tell us rather repeatedly that they've got a hard time finding and then recruiting individuals with the skills they require. Um, it's a generic issue that ranges across everything from pre presentability and basic communication in English as their first language, right up through to specialized skills like foreign languages. Um, they're very good at pounding the table and telling us there's a problem. The public sector is then very good at reorganizing the deck chairs of the skills system endlessly without actually solving said problem, um, and the two have never actually arrived at any kind of accord. So we've got a frustrated business community, uh, a frustrated public sector that just reshuffles things around, um, and what falls in between? Well, both those young people and individual learners, and of course our language needs as an economy. Um, these skills are especially seen as absent amongst native-born Britons. Um, Nick referred earlier to the potential need to recruit migrants into the police force in order to satisfy linguistic requirements. It's also happening quite often uh, across the small and medium-sized business community. I was with a creative sector business in Hastings in, in East Sussex a couple of weeks ago, who was telling me about how difficult it was for them to fight the migration system in order to get native Chinese speakers whom they required in order to grow that particular creative sector business. It's not an uncommon thing for me. The intersection between the migration system and, of course, language and business growth is absolutely tremendous. And the actions being taken, you know, Nick mentioned uh, Damien Green, our current immigration minister, immigration minister the, the, the actions being taken by the government at the moment to limit non-EU migration are of major concern to many of these companies because what they will do at the end of the day um, is really reduce our pool of potential language skills and our ability to help uh, some SMEs internationalize. So we have fought very hard in recent months, not to say to the government, don't reduce migration if that's your political priority, but to think about it in terms of the economy and in terms of the skills businesses are going to require in order to drive the growth which everyone says the private sector must create. So a massive priority for local businesses. Um, I say local. Um, advisedly, because of course chambers of commerce are inherently local, they've got front doors in every town and city around the country and indeed around the world if you look at the global chamber network. Um, schools, colleges and further education institutions are actually the players that are referred to by businesses locally. Um, I hate to burst the bubble of those of you who work in universities and higher education institutions, they're actually less concerned with you, they're concerned with the language skills coming out of the education system and then out of the FE system, because that is where they're recruiting most of their people from. We have a rarefied intellectual debate in this country, I say this as an Ivy League and Oxbridge graduate turning against my own, um, where we think that everything is about universities, and quite frankly it's not. 70% of young people don't actually go to or finish university, and yet some of them will require language skills if they are to get the jobs of tomorrow with some of these internationalizing uh, companies, and we ignore that at our peril. Um, I never usually mention the competition uh, when at a talk like this, but a recent uh, CBI survey said that 76% of employers surveyed were unhappy with the language skills of job applicants. Well, that doesn't surprise me. I see it week in and week out. On to my second area, I've sort of pounded the table a bit for the local employer, which is the impact of uh, poor language skills and cultural understanding on UK exports. I've got some statistics here that come out of a survey that we conducted of 7,000 businesses uh, just as recently as January of this year. Um, about 5% said that language and cultural difficulties stopped them from exporting. It may seem like a small number, but when you scale that up to the number of businesses we have in the UK, which is about 4.5 million, it is significant. Um, compare that to 9% who said that they had difficulty finding overseas customers or agents, and 6% who said they had difficulty sourcing market information. Well, some of that will have a read across to language as well. So when you aggregate those figures, they're quite big indeed. And 3% of non-exporters, those who said they had no interest in the export market whatsoever, said that language training would encourage them. Again, not a massive number, and a little bit reactive, but still really important, because at the end of the day, that's thousands of businesses who are saying, we need better language training both for ourselves and our employees if we're going to see growth in our export volumes. Um, there's also a generic training on how to do business abroad category, which received a much bigger score in the double digits. Again, an area for investigation. Um, amongst previous exporters, our sample was very small, but 6.1% of them said they stopped exporting because of language and cultural difficulties. Right? That has a clear read across and a clear economic impact, and it's, again, not something we can ignore. My additional suspicion in all of this is that UK SME exporters are artificially attracted to North American and continental European markets 
precisely because they have a lack of language skills. Um, our biggest export uh, market is the US. Uh, most of the others in the top 10 are European countries. Everyone I've just mentioned is a slow growth uh, economy in the future. The Germans may roar ahead, well, comparatively roar ahead a little bit faster than the rest of us, but the simple fact of the matter is these are all slow growth economies, but this is where most of our SMEs are exports. We've got a major disjuncture here. Um, so overall, if you scale this up to the UK economy as well, you've got thousands of companies that see language as a barrier to jobs and growth. Um, it's statistically significant. And I, I look to you as people working in the language community to help us carry the flag for this and to solve this particular conundrum. Third and final area uh, is the impact of all of this on Britain's ability to shape the business environment. Um, three quarters of the legislation affecting most of my member businesses comes from Brussels, not from Whitehall, quite simply. And of course we are 12% of the EU population and we have only 5% of the jobs in the European institutions. Um, most EU officials, especially the culturally and intellectually superior ones who speak 15 different languages, attribute this to our lack of language skills. Um, they're, they're right, even though great, they're right. Um, it's not often considered that the lack of purchase, this informal purchase in the European institutions at the end of the day, it has a direct impact on the environment within which our businesses operate. If we're not the ones in those meetings where informally legislative proposals are hashed out and then drafted, we end up with things like one on the table today, the Pregnant Workers Directive, um, which basically seeks to enshrine some of the Franco-German model uh, of parental leave, which could undermine the UK's more flexible model, which actually, there's a consensus, works fairly well in, in its current form. And it's because we're not at the table, we're not influencing some of those decisions. Um, working Time Directive is another one. Agency Workers Directive. You know, none of them really compatible with the workings of the British labour market, but pushed through by countries with a sort of Napoleonic bent, um, and who think that our flexible labour market is not good. They are the ones at the negotiating table flashing these things out. We are not there. It is a problem. Um, the EU budget, another clear area of consideration. We'd like to see more spending on competitiveness, business competitiveness, less on agriculture and less on, 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 on regional economic development. Right? We're not going to win that fight again with a smaller number of the officials in the European Civil Service, nor with the lack of engagement that we have, partially due to our lack of language skills. So and I'm sure that this situation extends to some of the other international fora in which we participate. I have no doubt that our diplomatic service, which does have fairly good language learning, is doing its level best. But that in and of itself is not enough. We need a more broadly based set of language skills in order to fight for our competitiveness and our model of doing things. So what does all this mean for the future, just finally? Um, you know all about declining GCSE language participation and everything else. I don't need to talk to you about that. Um, you know about the marginalization of language learning and the over-specialization in things. You know, I, I call this the, the underwater basket weaving problem. We've got courses in absolutely everything right now, many of which businesses don't find particularly useful. Um, we've got constant change in the skills and education system, meaning that there's no guarantee that things like an English baccalaureate that privileges language learning will solve the problem. That could be jumped in the next three years and then we'll have the next thing. We constantly, constantly reorganize to very little effect. The Germans don't do it. The Americans don't do it, no one else does. We've got to stop as well. Um, third point, apprenticeships. There's this huge drive to increase apprenticeships. This comes back to my previous point about having, focusing more on the 70% who don't go to university or finish at university. How do we incorporate language learning into apprenticeships so that these people can be part of the force to internationalize companies tomorrow? <coughs> um, and, you know, also, there's, there's a really important point here as well. There is a perception amongst many employers that degrees solely in languages are not necessarily going to give them the young people with the skills they require. So there is, a, I think, a great interest in looking at ways to combine business skills with language skills to see them as one and the same and to combine them in degree level courses. And of course, we'll turn the mirror on ourselves as well. SMEs need to do better. We need management and leadership training for businesses so that they recognize the importance of language as a potential growth instrument going forward. I don't think most of them do. So there's quite a lot here. Um, there's quite a lot of areas where the academic agenda on languages and the business agenda actually intersect. And I hope we can discuss some of them uh, in the debate ahead. So thank you very much.